I say God made mammoth, Mother Nature takes care of it. She delivers the snow, she delivers the good weather, the bad weather. Whatever it takes. Every day, there's a difference in the place you saw yesterday. It's kind of mystic in that aspect. The best skiing in the world, people try to tell me, and of course I back off a little bit and said, well, maybe that's possible. On the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, the peaks thrust upwards with summits well over 14,000 feet. This range is higher than any other in the lower 48 states. It is a classic western landscape, and no one belongs in this place more than Dave McCoy. I was here for a purpose, and I didn't always know what the purpose was, but I was always given help by people that wanted to be here like I did. And we just grew together, and it grew into what Mammoth is known of today, from nothing to something great. As recently as the 1930s, no more than a handful of hardy souls would even attempt to scratch out a living in this place where the snow starts falling in October and doesn't let up until May. Dave McCoy saw it differently. Despite seemingly insurmountable obstacles, he accomplished here what everyone else said couldn't be done. When you hear the legend of Dave McCoy, it's a sort of Paul Bunyan character. It gets really larger than life, and many things about Dave are, are truly larger than life. When the only boundary you know is the horizon, that's real freedom. And it's as infectious as malaria or anything else. Nineteen thirty-five. Dave McCoy is twenty years old and has come to the Eastern Sierra to find freedom and a new life. First stop, the small town of Independence. I uh, was headed for Jim's restaurant, and Jim, the owner, said, "We have a need for you right now, so put this apron on and start working." So I became dishwasher garbage collector, uh, waiter, whatever, in a short length of time. And uh, I loved it all. Dave was the new kid on the block, and it didn't take long before he caught the eye of a vibrant young girl named Roma Carrier. Dave was a soda jerk, as they called it in those days, in a restaurant in Independence. And I was a high school cheerleader. So all of us stopped there to get ice cream sodas, and he waited on us. And I nudged a girl, and I said, I wonder who that is. And she says, I don't know, I think he's new in town. And I said, well, we got to find out. And she was hopping around, singing and keeping them all going. And 
I thought, that's the gal for me. And I was really serious about it in my own mind. But Dave was quiet and reserved, and he didn't speak with Roma that day. It would be more than a year before he saw her again. With the pretty cheerleader never far from his mind, Dave threw himself into his new life. There was food on the table, a place to sleep at night, and new friends to meet every day. But I was an outdoor person, and here I was with an indoor job. It was fun, it gave me everything I needed, but at evening, around nine o'clock usually when they shut the door, I'd go outside and I'd get in the alleyway and run and jump up and down and hoot and holler and say how free I was. Dave's new friends urged him to explore that freedom in the vast backcountry that was right out their back door. Dave showed them a way to make it more fun. Prior to going to Independence, I had learned how to ski, and I made my own skis, and that's why I really loved this country, because of the snow. To find freedom on the side of a hill just by, if you will, climbing the hill and sliding down, uh, that's all we asked for. I don't know what they call a person like that to get out and do something different today, but uh, we weren't crazy. We were crazy over the fun we were having, I guess. I'd put it that way. <laughs> like an afternoon picnic. Before TV, before radios, really, when families were families and families got together and enjoyed themselves, that's what skiing was. It was just a picnic for everybody and a get out and get a slope and try to ski on it. But to ski down that slope, you first had to climb it. This limited the time you could spend skiing. The solution was just around the corner. Now, there's an old axiom that the reason for a lot of good ideas is that you steal the idea and conceal the source of the theft. And I think this might apply when Dave and his half a dozen skiers and Bishop were climbing and they read about these rope toes. The very first rope toe in the U.S. had recently been built in Vermont and it was creating a buzz in the skiing community. Suddenly, it seemed possible to ski all day without ever having to climb the hill. Dave and his buddies managed to cobble together enough pieces and parts to build a rudimentary rope toe of their own. Skiing in the Eastern Sierra was never the same. We put together a, a, a car chassis, stripped the wheels off of it and everything, and, and made a rope toe out of that. On a good day, the rope toe would run all day without breaking, and you know, the splices would fall apart. A shiv would fall off of a tree, the engine would stop, then everybody would just sit down, sit down for a little while and have lunch or whatever, but it required an awful lot of stamina. And imagine a, a piece of wet hemp, and you just had to squeeze really hard, your hands worked like a clutch, and then you just hung on as long as you could. But uh, hey, it beat climbing because you, know, you go up to 400 vertical feet in two or three minutes. Despite the hardships of hanging on, the rope toes opened up skiing to anyone, and a new social activity was born, the ski club. It was a bunch of crazy people that get together to go skiing. And they were so crazy, they just wanted to have fun. And going up the hill was as much fun as coming down the hill. In fact, I think some people had more fun hanging onto the rope going uphill than they did struggling to get down the hill. Ski clubs were starting to pop up all over Southern California, and Hollywood's answer to the new trend was the Wooden Wing Ski Club. This exclusive club was populated with a who's who of fame and fortune. The Hollywood elite had discovered the slopes of the Eastern Sierra. Even though Dave occasionally mingled with the rich and famous, he was always happiest out on the slopes skiing. But despite his shy demeanor, he became a bit of a local celebrity himself. Well, he used to ride through town on his black and white Harley in the wintertime with his skis strapped on the side, brown, really brown from the, the sun, 
and I would just swoon, of course. It's so stupid. <laughs> it comes to pass that my brother knew him really well and had been fishing with him and skiing with him and hiking with him. And the fair time came around and uh, some girl wanted me to take her to the fair and I didn't want to do it and I'm not going to the fair or something else, right? I have another date, I guess is what I said. And so she said, well, I'll see you there and I want to meet this date. So he didn't know what to do. So he came to my brother and he said, I wonder if Rome would go to the carnival with me. So he asked me and I said, sure, you bet. But I didn't know at the time he was just substituting me. That made me kind of mad later. But we just had so much fun. And ever after that, we were a, a couple. My grandmother would come out and say, Roma, you know, you don't want to get involved with this boy. And I said, why? He's going to kill you. Oh, we had so much fun, it's unbelievable. And she likes to tell how we'd be going down the road at 90 miles an hour, and she decided she wanted to be in front, and I just kind of step out on one peg and lean out a little bit. I would go under the leg and get on the seat and grab the handlebars as we are going, and we didn't let up on speed. I'd have a fit if my kids had done that. By 1937, Dave was ready to move on from his job at the restaurant. Some of his new friends worked as snow surveyors for the Department of Water and Power, and Dave admired their work. When it snowed heavy that winter, they didn't have enough people that could ski to go to the base of the Sierra to measure the streams. And uh, they found themselves in a tight spot, and one of the Hydrographer says, well, uh, Dave can do it. A chance meeting in the drugstore with the head of the water department sealed the deal. And I walked in and he saw me. I just happened to have a little t-shirt on and it was winter time. And he said, uh, Sonny, if you uh, come to work for me, you're going to have to wear more than that. And I said, oh. And it was a little quiet. He says, I'll see you Monday. Being a hydrographer was, was really the perfect job for Dave. Uh, it, being able to be outdoors and get paid for it uh, was really a, really a dream come true for him. You know, it took a lot of uh, stamina, a lot of whatever you want to call it, to slog up four or five thousand vertical feet and take snow samples and be out there for three or four days at a time. Come home, pick up a paycheck once a month, and then on weekends run rope toes. Dave was exceptionally good at his new job, and he relished every moment he spent skiing into the backcountry. High up on the top of Mammoth Mountain, Dave also learned something about weather. The winds coming across Mammoth are tremendous. Uh, Every year, we'll register 180 mile an hour winds in the top of the mountain. I'll tell you how we measure the wind. You know, most people have an anemometer and they read it, the, but if you're up there and there's a, just a small rock hitting you, well, it's not blowing too hard, but when they get up to half inch or inch and a half, they're rolling at you. Uh, you think it's picking up. And then the big snowfall will come. It's wild, it's ferocious, and the snow's deep. There's very few places you can describe to anyone where you get six feet of snow overnight. But Mammoth Mountain was still beyond the reach of the average skier. The place to go was the much more accessible McGee Mountain just south of Mammoth. Right next to the highway, the slopes of McGee made for a convenient spot to build a rope tow. I needed some money to buy the motor and a little rope tow that I'd built for the Eastern Sierra Ski Club. Dave went in a bank in Bishop, California, and tried to borrow $86 on his motorcycle to buy the parts for his first rope tow. The banker said, I won't do that because you can get on your motorcycle and go to Los Angeles and drink it up. 
So Dave left the bank, and the banker's secretary said, if you don't, if you don't loan that nice young man that $86, I'm going to quit. The banker loaned Dave the money, and Dave married the secretary. I loved every part of my life with him, and especially when he started introducing me to new things like the outdoors and the, the back country and fishing and hiking and skiing. The newlyweds spent every free moment together outdoors. Dave challenged his new bride to come ski with him on Mammoth. We would hike up there to go skiing and when we got almost to the top, it was so steep that my, my knees would be hitting my face and I was having a hard time with my skis, so he would always take my skis on the last part of it. Dave's philosophies really are bringing out the best in other people and him inspiring them to understand themselves and their strengths and apply that to their world. Then the first time I went off the cornice, Dave said, I just want you to look at it. Put your skis on, just look at it and then just take off. I said, okay, okay. Got on my skis and I went up and I looked and I backed up. He said, what's the matter? And I said, I just need to look again. So <laughs> I looked three times and backed up. And the next time I went up, he went <laughs> and pushed me off. Take the cat and hold it upside down and drop it and see it flip. That was a start. But I made it, <laughs> I didn't fall. Together, Dave and Roma became the de facto king and queen of the region's budding ski community. Every weekend was devoted to improving their skiing and keeping the rope toes running. The fun did have its costs, however. Nobody had to pay. And I was foolish enough to think that, well, if I start a rope toe, we can all go skiing, we can all have fun. and. It won't cost that much. But there came a day when we didn't know whether we were going to eat that night. So this one morning he said, we don't have enough money for gasoline for tomorrow, so you're going to have to, you are going to have to charge for the people to ride. And I said, me? I can't do that. And he said, well, you have to. It was kind of a difficult decision for me because I didn't like to take people's money. So I said, well, well how, I, how much do I charge? And he said, at least 50 cents a day. I said, what? He said, I can't do it, honey. I'm too busy. I'm up splicing the rope. <laughs> so I did. I had to charge. No, it was a lot different in the 30s in the Depression. And they were both products of that. And they knew what it was like to be hungry and what it was like to save and plan for the future. Roma's little donation box filled up quickly. Turns out people were more than happy to help the McCoys keep their rope toe running. I said, look, 15 bucks. I said, this might be a pretty good deal. <laughs> I said, yeah, we eat tonight. In the early 40s, ski racing became a serious pastime in the Sierra. Dave was also bitten by the bug, entering ski races every chance he got and blowing away the competition. I know that when Dave came to the, to the uh, Silver Dollar Derby, everybody said, uh-oh, you know, wherever we we're going to place, we're going to be one farther down. He'd be going if you will, at the speed, nobody would, could keep up with him, but he didn't look like he was going at all. He just was that smooth. He just, he had it all together. No wasted motion. 
Dave was quickly becoming the rising star in the world of ski racing. But then, disaster. 1942. Roma is expecting their first child and Dave is on his way to enter a race at Sugar Bowl up near Lake Tahoe. Along the way, he spots another hydrographer working alongside the road. So I stopped and went down and visited with him because that was very interesting to me to meet another guy that was doing the same work in a different area and see now he did it and why. And that made me a little late getting into Sugar Bowl to run the downhill. And I didn't have a pre-run on it to know what it was exactly like. But uh, they let me start because of my record as a downhiller. And it was in the spring. It wasn't in the time you normally be running downhill like that. And as I went down the Eagle Run, it had a sharp right turn after a steep schuss. And I, as I approached it, the whole area right in there settled and I hit it with my shin. The phone call came that they were gonna put him on the train from Sugar Bowl. It took them about four hours to get me to Reno. I was in a mail car on the Southern Pacific Rail. They uh, immediately said this leg will have to come off. It's, it'll have gangrene and no time. And he said, I don't think so. So they came in and asked me, and I got really mad. I said, absolutely not. You're not going to touch that leg. You're going to set it. You're not going to, to amputate it. They put me in the hospital, uh, rigging over the top of the bed and put a sheet down from each side and laid my leg in it and left it that way. For three weeks, Dave lay on his back, suffering, while the doctors waited for the McCoys to give in and let them take his leg. His salvation came from a visiting doctor from San Francisco. He said, I'd like to fix that leg. And he took five hours of just putting the bones together and wiring them together with platinum wire. And he said, he thought it was going to be all right. He went back to work at Crowley, and he could not walk, but he could get on his skis and, and ski to his clock stations. And when he'd get off his skis, he'd have to crawl over and change the water gauges, you know, because he couldn't walk on it. And then he got back on his skis and could ski all these miles home. I mean, he did it. Now, who else would do that? He did it on that leg. When Dave wasn't working at his job, he was supplementing the family's meager income by fishing and hunting. But his leg wasn't healing properly. It was time for a radical new approach. I went back to the same doctors after, and they said, there's just too much gristle in the bone. It's never going to heal. So we'd like to do a bone graft, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, it was okay with me. They finally had to take the strip of bone out of his good leg, took the messed up bone in his bad leg and mashed it all up. And packed that bone, the crush bone, back into my right leg, put the graft piece in the left leg, and I started to get okay. You know, the gritty determination that, that led him to defy medical experts it really served him well as he defied the experts of the ski industry and the, the resort business in the, in the years after that. Dave got back on his skis and back on the slopes. Not only was he entering races again, he was winning them. That competitive spirit pushed him always forward. Dave was more determined than ever to pick up where he had left off. Well, being a breadwinner for a family the size we had and the income that we had, I had to have more than one job. Uh, I was a hydrographer a certain number of hours a day. I was cutting wood or 
guiding fishermen or hunters, and I was on the mountain building and trying to keep it going. There's been several people in the industry that really thought outside the box, not very many. Uh, Dave thought way out of the box, and it came from his lifelong history of being a snow surveyor, spending most of his life in the Sierras. But just when Dave got back to work on his rope toes, the snow started to disappear. McGee Mountain was no longer as reliable as it had once been. Rather than get discouraged, Dave packed up his equipment and moved it to higher ground. And so he moved on up to Mammoth Mountain, and everybody said, Dave, you cannot overpower this much snow. I mean, 20, 30, 40 feet of snow. The storms come powering you know, through San Francisco across the San Joaquin, and they just go right up that valley, and they, they all get squeezed out right at the top of Mammoth. Dave and others like him had proved that there was a reason for people to ski up here, so they brought in the experts. But they said it was too remote, it was too cold, it was too alpine, it was too far away from anything. No infrastructure, too expensive, and had awful weather. I mean, it snowed, <laughs> which Dave thought was a pretty good idea for a ski resort, actually. I've had too many good days by now, and I found myself so frequently on the backside and the north side of the mountain with a little rope tow and two or three hundred people, and we were doing okay. Mammoth's higher elevation did present a few new challenges. All that extra snow meant just getting to the lift wasn't as easy as it used to be. You know, we'd all be out of breath, and even though we were in a lot better shape in those days, and it would be a long slog into where you could then hang on a rope toe all day and stretch one arm and make it longer than the other. Dave knew that if skiers couldn't drive into where he had set up the rope toes, he would have to find another way to get them there. The end of World War II provided him with a unique solution. Imagine a Humvee without wheels turned upside down, and that's a weasel. It has a set of tracks like a Caterpillar tractor. That's a World War II 10th Mountain Division vehicle. Uh, in deep snow, the, it was designed so that the bottom of it would actually slide on the snow. And I think there was a time when Dave bought some of them in the $100 range at surplus because there wasn't a big, who wants a weasel for guy's sakes? What do I want a weasel for? The whistles were used for only one thing, and that was to get the people from the parking lot, where the snow got so deep that Dave couldn't plow it out. One to three miles, whatever length it is, to base lodge one. And then they'd go back and pick up another load. Yeah, we would seat uh, 20, I think, on the weasel and have a rope a quarter of a mile long sometimes towing the people behind us and they were singing and all these great songs and having fun. Dave provides the playground and the place where people can find freedom. We all had skis, we all had gravity, and every one of us was equal. And I think that Dave, in his infinite wisdom, leveled the playing field for all socioeconomic groups because somebody can come up working in a Century City high-rise as a hotshot $500 an hour attorney. And that doesn't make him turn his skis any better than somebody that's living in the parking lot in the back of their car. As Dave continued to improve his operation, he also began coaching the local ski team. He talks about how uh how he taught the kids how to have fun, how to want to come to the mountain, how to see the things around them, to feel the things around them, to understand them. He talks about it more like it's education than it was an athletic experience. He just, he sees the, uh, he sees the whole world completely differently, completely differently. If, uh, if they didn't make the Olympic team and if they didn't make the FIS team, which were their goals, some of them, if they only learned how to ski and have fun. That was enough for me. 
Dave recognized the wealth of talent he had in not only the local men, but the women as well. I think Dave was a pioneer with coaching women. And they always looked up to him, in the, in he, but he didn't coach them all alike. I mean, each one of them had different personalities, you know, and different temperaments. So he'd have to do...